of the Tate, Miami-Dade County PD and other departments in South Florida move toward body cameras, but the details, the devil, are in the details. Overtime and on deadline, Florida lawmakers kill Medicaid expansion and work the weekend to come up with a budget. Cuba conundrum, Congress moves to block the increasing flow of travelers and trade to the island. So much to take to the round table this morning. Good morning. Welcome. Great to have you part of the program today. As Great to have you back after your Thank absence you. last week. And we are going to begin this morning with a closer look at body cameras on police officers. Supporters say those cameras will provide indisputable proof of what happens when police and citizens interact. Those who want the cameras say they'll reduce instances of alleged police brutality. Might a fatal confrontation been prevented if the officer in Ferguson, Missouri had been wearing a body camera? And or might it have shown the officer was justified in using lethal force? Police departments around South Florida are now moving toward deploying this new tool, as is Miami-Dade's mayor. Uh, we've gone through a long process, probably a two or three year process to get to this point. Nothing has been rushed, very analytical. We've uh, taken our time. Uh, the public defender is in favor of it, the state attorney is in favor of it. So when those two sides are in favor of something, it's got to be pretty good. Uh, I'm in favor of it, and I think the people are in favor of it, and the nation's in favor of it. But John Rivera, the president of the Miami Dade County Police Benevolent Association, has his reservations about the body cameras. He is the longtime leader of the county's police union. We will find out this morning where he and the union stand on this issue. Russell Benford is deputy mayor of Miami Dade County, a top administrator whose responsibilities include overseeing the county's police department, fire rescue department, corrections, indeed, all of public safety. Dwayne Flournoy is the chief of police in Hallandale Beach. He is preparing now a presentation for the mayor and commission on the use of body cameras by his officers. Chief Flournoy joined the Hallandale Beach Department in 87, 1987, rose up through the ranks to become chief in what, 2011, Chief, was it? Yes, sir. Well, congrats to that. Uh, good and morning. Uh, good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Thank you for good being morning. here. We started our careers the same time. Wow, okay. <laughs> all, right. all right, John Rivera, um, uh, where do you and where does the PBA stand on the use of police body cameras? Well, we stand with the Department of Justice and we say move slowly on this thing. We think that in Miami-Dade County it's being used for political reasons. There's a lot of other things we need to do. We're six to 800 police officers short. We have failed radio system. We have police cars and a fleet that's that's not working well. We have uh, we invested money in this uh, crime center that uh, just went nowhere. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of projects that were started that haven't finished. And if the cameras uh, program is any indication by how we treated the other things, I think it's going to be a failure uh, in short order. You know, you mentioned it might be political. I'm, I'm interested to hear Chief Flournoy, Allendale Beach Police Department is about to be the first in South Florida to deploy the cameras. Is that at, at all political in your city? Actually, uh, we began this discussion a while ago, but it did come as a directive from the uh, uh, city commission to move forward. But to add on to um, what the uh, Dade County uh, PBA just said, one thing that we did find is that all the studies show that you should start out slow, you should start out with a pilot program, and you should work through those things in a small group before deploying to your larger group because um, and that's where you're going to find your mistakes and your errors. So initially in Hallandale, we were, we were thinking about doing a full-on program, but now we're going to do a pilot program starting many, out with the How year. many cameras are you going to start we're with? We're going to start out with the patrol division, and we're only going to deploy 28 cameras. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's a good way to begin. Uh, Deputy Mayor Benford, great to have you with us this morning. Thank you, Michael. Now, uh, on, uh, I believe, Tuesday, I was at Miami-Dade County Hall, when the commission said, go ahead, seek bids for 500 cameras to begin with yes. for Miami-Dade County Police. Is that a pilot program or is that a full-blown commitment? Well, it's a, it's a full-blown commitment. The mayor has made a commitment to body cameras for uh, Miami-Dade County uh, Police Department. So back in 2013, we did test you know, three cameras. We had a small control group that looked at using those cameras. Yeah. We looked at different types of cameras and the technology. But we're at the point where we're moving forward. 
uh, the RFP was released this week for the first 500 cameras. We, the mayor included $1 million in the budget this fiscal year, and in the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, the mayor's added another $1 million for the second 500 cameras. All right, so 1,000 so cameras altogether on Miami-Dade County police officers. When could that happen? It's going to happen as soon as possible. Like I said, the RP is on the, is on the street, so we hope before the end of this calendar year mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do that. But I, I do, Michael, want to point out one important thing. Uh, when we talked about the body cameras, it was, it was critical, it, very important for the commission that we work with the PBA on the policies. And, and we did that, and we came together. We provided a, a, a policy for the use of those cameras by officers. And one of the important things that came out of that was that the, the folks at the PBA stressed that we need to have ongoing training you know, for those mm -hmm. officers, and that's something we're going to commit to doing. So yeah. we're not going to roll them out faster than we need to. We're going to make sure okay. our officers are prepared. Well, I think we should start getting into some nitty-gritty details. The, the devil you mentioned is in the details. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the privacy. Not only privacy for whatever subjects may be in camera's view, but for the officers themselves, officers who may have conversations in a car with their partner. I mean, what, what do you see as the privacy issues and how to solve them as this implementation goes forward. Well, that's some of the problems that uh, that we uh, encountered as we were trying to do this policy. The county did try to rush us through the thing. Uh, we, we we do still feel a bit rushed, but it was a product that we both worked on. Uh, not only privacy, uh, but we believe that there are some problems with this camera, like for example, training. We did the pilot program, which we didn't even find out about until about a year and a half later. But they, what they did was they took the cameras out of the boxes, they showed them how to turn it on and off, and they said, go ahead and do this. This is not proper training in any department, so I, I, I certainly commend Hallandale for doing it the right way. I think Miami-Dade should do it the right way. Well, and when well, they wait, say wait. a million dollars, I laughed when they said the million dollars last time. I laughed when they said a million dollars this time. This is Dade County paperwork. It says five million, unless this is another one of those, oops, we made another you know, typographical error. This says five million dollars, folks. What? And this is not even a drop in the that bucket. That is the appropriation for the body cameras? Yes, sir. Right? Is, I so mean, the is million that... is for the, for the initial rollout, I and think. So with respect to appropriations, each year Miami-Dade County uh, approves a budget which appropriates funds. In the current fiscal year, there one, there's $1 million in, the, in this budget for body cameras. In the proposed budget for next year, there's $1 million in that budget. With respect to the bid document, the RFP, we are asking for an allocation of up to authority of up to $5 million to purchase over the next few years the body cameras in the system. So. Chief, what's Hallandale Beach's budget? How are you finding the allocation as opposed to what it buys? Actually, our uh, body camera is in an entire program for the city's entire surveillance program. So for the first year, we're only budgeting uh, approximately $56,000 to get the camera and to do the storage. But the five-year contract of the program is just under about $200,000. And that includes the body camera and the storage, which uh, you know, a lot of concentration is on the camera, but actually the cost comes when you start it, when you begin to store the yeah. data. Well, I believe the county, uh, as the mayor explained to me uh, the other day, uh, this contract includes the storage fee. Yes. But, you know, uh, John Rivera, I, I, I think a, a legitimate question for police officers and citizens uh, at large is, are these cameras going to be automatic? Will they simply begin rolling whenever an officer approaches somebody at a traffic stop or at a confrontation of some kind? I mean, what is the best way to do this uh, to make sure that the, the cameras roll when they, when they need to? Well, Michael, that's a great question. And we're not, again, that's one of those things that I'm really adamant about because we're not telling the public the truth. Those cameras roll constantly. And what they do is a 30 second loop. So they're constantly running. Then you can turn it on as they calling it turning it on, but it's already on. But what you do is by virtually turning it on, then what it does, it, does, it stops the loop. So mm -hmm. it captures 30 seconds beforehand and then it'll continue until you shut it off. But those cameras are constantly on and the public needs to know that. Um, listen, there's a lot of things about those cameras. Look, one of the funniest things but, about but the policy. But doesn't it have to be on? Because if, a, if an officer had sway into when to turn it on and off, it would negate the fact that this could be an unvarnished, unblinking look at a course of events, wouldn't it? Police will always be accused of everything. We're the punching bags to everything, to everyone, to every situation. I will tell you one of the funniest things, and you should ask this. Why, when they create a policy, they say videotape somebody else, but the policy prohibits a police officer from videoing elected officials, videoing their command staff. Why is that? 
do unto others what I don't want done unto me. Right, We're, but that's apples to oranges, though. Well, no, I mean, mistaken. I think it. I think it shows the mindset. We're willing to to video the public, but we don't want to be videoed ourselves. Why can't we video elected officials? Why can't we video? Well, well, we're talking, you know, of course, I mean, I don't know in what setting you're talking about, John. Yeah. But I mean, if you, in every setting, you know, in every but setting, is every that setting. a policy? Right. That, but to clear up the uh, the issue about the camera always being on, and that's actually advantageous for the officers because what it does when the officer activates the camera it goes back and it gets the 30 seconds of video it does not capture the 30 seconds of audio and then it adds the audio on hmm. the 31st second in capture 4 and that's to protect the officer in case there is some privacy conversations that are going on context. it doesn't have the audio it only has the 30 seconds of video. All right, right we're going to pick up right where we left off after this quick break. Stay with us. Good. Live in our studio this Sunday morning, a lively discussion about uh, police cameras or police officers with body cameras with Chief Florinay from Florinoy, excuse me, from Hallandale Beach, Russell Benford, Deputy Mayor of Miami Dade County, and John Rivera a long time head of the PBA. John, uh, let's widen the scope a little bit. The reason sure. that this conversation is happening, not only here, but across the country, uh, are the incidents like the ones in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, North Charleston, South Carolina, New York, uh, Cleveland. Uh, there have been these, uh, you know, uh, just very, very disturbing incidents where uh, young black men have been shot and in most of these instances, there have not been cameras. Now, isn't it true that if there had been cameras on the officers, that in many instances, or you believe in many instances, the officers' actions would have been exonerated? Absolutely, 100% not true. In the Ferguson situation, that, that uprising didn't happen because of lack of cameras. That happened because the elected officials were using the community to, to fill in the gap, and, and the police were the vehicle to, 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 to harass the community. Well, excuse me, but the grand jury, I think, uh, pretty much came back with a very thorough examination Absolutely. and said that the officer, in fact, was acting in self-defense. What I'm saying is that a couple of weeks of turmoil and riots might not have happened if within 12 hours the police department, instead of doing what they and the politicians said, just released the videotape and show that this very large young man, Michael Brown, uh, was uh, was attacking that police officer. Michael, I don't think a, a piece of equipment will ever uh, replace the, the, the problems, the harassment that are created by a particular government. In that particular case, Ferguson, for example, is a great example. I'm glad you guys keep using it, is the fact that the grand jury did look into it very deeply and they did exonerate the police officer and to this day, all the media outlets still use Ferguson as an example when Ferguson was a prime example that the officer was correct. You know what's so interesting about all of these cases that you just mentioned is this is cell phone camera video. This is personal video that can be released right away. I suspect when we have police issue video that's not going to be released to the public so quickly chief uh, or well, I, listen, the, 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 these videos are subject evidence. to public records just like any other piece of, but, of, of information that we, we but capture what could as a also county. Be evidence, and evidence it is evidence. isn't always yeah. it is evidence. In an and ongoing investigation, though, yes. it's going to be held for a while. But I think that's the most important thing in this in this debate. And, I, and, I, and the mayor talked about the support from the state attorney's office and from the public defender. The more evidence we have in any circumstance, it's a be it's a, it's a good thing. You know, the more evidence we have, the better for the police department, the better for the defendant, the better for this community. Uh, we need to have that information, and it, this more than anything is going to protect our officers because they're going to use this camera on a daily basis. But I think we will begin to evolve because we just recently seen it in Boston when uh, they encountered the, the mm -hmm. young man and there was uh, concerns the out shot there artist, yeah. who, yes, that he was shot in the back. And that incendiary type of allegation were beginning to have the community in uprise. To that benefit, they took video that they had and they said, we will present it to the family so the family can go out and quell these allegations to show that that's not the case. Yeah. And I think as we're involved in this body camera technology, law enforcement agencies and leaders will begin to know there's value in going ahead and releasing some things up front. Mm -hmm. That's not going to 
eventually erode any evidentiary value because well, it's not it, going to change. Yeah, I mean, we had the incident, uh, what, about two months ago, tragic incident in Miami Gardens where two officers encountered a young man, Laval Hall, who was in a psychotic episode. And uh, we could only see from the dash cam some of what was going on. Uh, I mean, Russell, I, I mean, that's another instance where, frankly, the dash cam video was almost tantalizing. We really would have loved to have seen uh, he was allegedly wielding a broom and was threatening the officers. Uh, and, and and that's an instance, is it not? Where absolutely, absolutely. It, I, I think it's it's in in a lot of ways irresponsible to to kind of you know put our head in the sand with respect to technology. You know, technology is evolving. People have cell phones. They they capture video all the time. Right. We need to to be ahead of the curve. It's important that our law enforcement has the tools it needs to protect our citizens every single day. And it's not just with respect to to body cameras. You know, this this fiscal year we've, we've ordered 650 new patrol cars each of the next four years you're going to see another 500 <coughs> patrol cars yeah. I know I know folks have talked about that we don't have enough officers on the street I do yeah. want to point out this year we have two classes of officers that are coming in next year four the mayor is going to increase our sworn officers on the street by 10 percent in the next 15 months and I think that's unprecedented and it's a shame that that's not talking Michael about. again that's not true they're saying they're increasing the police by 10 percent because we're already six to eight hundred short. I, I want to get 10 percent does I wanna, nothing. I want to get back to the, I, the camera I, issue. I, and can. that's OK. But I just like let's tell the truth about cameras, police, uh, radios, whatever it is. Just let's tell the truth. It, Matt, I, I want to get back to in a practical sense, the cameras, the storage of video. How long do you store the video for if you're going to have to redact the video for public use? Who redacts that? There was a Seattle Police Department came up with a study. It takes 60 times the amount of time as a length of the video to do a redaction. Who does that? What kind of manpower and woman power is that? What is that budget? It, are those practical issues that's anywhere what's not, at this point? Yeah, Glenda, that's a great question. I'm glad you guys are starting to ask it now. Those are the things that the department, especially Miami-Dade County, is not willing to talk about. The back-end cost, the the the. the you know, as a department as large as Miami Dade County, we're going to probably need a whole bureau to do all those types of things. Well, how about internal affairs? In I mean, I oh, mean, absolutely. In, in oh, it's going to be big money. Yeah, Five million before, dollars is before nothing. We run, excuse me, Russell. Before we run out of time, uh, John, I think your your question, Pepe Diaz, the county commissioner uh, in Miami Dade, wants six to eight hundred more officers to go back to levels of two thousand, but. Russell, that was when, that's before Miami Gardens, Absolutely. Doral created their own police yes. departments, and also the crime rate is down significantly yes. since Michael, then. you know, when we make decisions, we have to make decisions based on, on real data. I mean, we're not moving back 15, we're not rolling back the clock 15 years, we're moving forward. We're looking at new technologies, new ways to, to police. With respect to the numbers, we, people have talked about some of the FBI numbers with respect to where we should be. The facts are that the average for police departments in cities over 250,000 is about 2.6 officers per and resident. And we're 2.4, we're, we're in, 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 in the average in the southern United States is 2.5. With the addition of those 260 yeah. officers, we're going to be right where we need to be. Well, if you leave it there, we are out of time. Chief Flournoy, as you launch this program this summer, well, I hope you will stay in touch with us. and see As how that always, goes. Thank you so much. only an invitation away. All right, thank Appreciate you very much, you Chief. Here. Russell Benford, thank you. John thank Rivera. You. Real pleasure to have you come Always. in, Lisa. Thank you very much. No weekend off for lawmakers in special session trying to avert a government shutdown. And that is just one of the topics we take to today's Power Roundtable when we come back. All right, time now for an analytical and critical look at the week's top news stories with our Powerhouse Roundtable. And we have a stellar group of guests this morning. Doug Lyons, for the first time, the senior editorial writer at the Sun Sentinel. He's been writing editorials for the paper since 1998, and his portfolio includes state government and health policy issues. Mark Caputo, the Florida correspondent for Politico, the go-to website for all things political, and he's been in Tallahassee and filing daily reports during this special session from where Motel 6, right? <laughs> and we're glad to welcome back also Mike Mayo, local columnist for the Sun Sentinel. This morning he had such a great column about Plantation's War on Christmas, and later Michael, we ask, we will ask you to explain what that's all about. 
Christmas in, what are we in? June? Christmas in June, June. literally. <laughs> but, all Where right. am I? Where well, am I? welcome to welcome. all of you. And Doug, it's great to have you come in. Uh, Mark Caputo, I, we must turn to you first because you have, I don't know if it's the unenviable, but it is the task of being <laughs> in Tallahassee uh, during the special session and watching and listening. So bring us up to speed. The Senate amended its own fixed bill, the, their plan to expand Medicaid, uh, sent it over to the House. The House debated it. I watched that debate all day, seven hours. And it's probably an award for you somewhere in heaven. <laughs> well, that. my brain turned to tapioca pudding by the time it was over. But they overwhelmingly, of course, rejected the Senate plan. Right. So what happens now? Yeah, basically, it's one of those things where it was a fait accompli. We knew it was going to die. By the way, the Senate says it's not really Medicaid expansion. Right. They're using Medicaid money to expand people's opportunity to buy private health insurance. But uh, now that that's, that boil has been lanced, it's now time to get to the real work, which is figuring out what to do with what's called the low income pool for hospital funding, right. figuring out school funding and the like. Yesterday they did that with what's called the low income pool, LIP. Uh, they essentially came up with an agreement. They're still a little bit short of money and we don't really know all the details. What, 400 million or so was what they initially said? Probably, but that's 400 million in uh, state match money. It draws down yeah. about 600 million, it's about a billion dollars. What we don't really know is what they call IGT money, which is, yeah. uh, par pardon me of boring you with all the ABCs of this, which is mm -hmm. called in intergovernment inter transfer money. Uh, a lot of it's paid in Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach. Uh, there's also a little in, in, uh, in Tampa and Hillsborough. We don't know what they're really going to do with that cash. They also raised uh, the amount of per pupil spending that they're going to do in Florida, and they might do tax cuts. But before we get to the whole budget nitty gritty, I mean, you talk about a lance being boiled. I'm sorry, this is still a festering sore. We have an issue of a lot of poor working people who don't have health insurance, and our state legislature is completely uh, insensitive to their needs and the rank hypocrisy that goes on where they're now complaining about oh the federal government is 18 trillion in debt yeah. well that doesn't stop our state government for drawing down federal funds for transportation for education but now when you're talking about giving poor people the access to some private health care they have an issue with it I'm sorry it just makes me sick and people should be outraged about this and I but haven't heard the, anybody talk about how much that costs everyone now there, no one's talking there is, about. There is the, no outrage. That's that's the problem. Why, why is that, Doug? Why is that? You know, I I just think it's one of those issues where you have um, politicians on the front line who see this as a this whole thing. In my mind, seems to be this is another blow against Obamacare and the Affordable Health Care Act. We don't want the money from Washington, which doesn't make any sense to me since we're paying the money to Washington, yeah, and now we're going to dip into our pocket again to pay the four hundred million dollars that will help these hospitals a lot. That, that's a good point. I, I don't want to be the defender of the legislature, just, just or the, the, the GOP leadership there, but understand that their, their core argument outside of these other issues, which I believe is more true than mm -hmm. not, is, is that eventually if you are going to expand the Medicaid system, you are going to put more and more state tax dollars on the line. Now there's pushback against that because yes, you're going to put more state tax dollars on the line, but they keep cutting uh, taxes. If they didn't cut those taxes but instead plowed them into the system, yeah. it would... And it's cost kind of shifting well, because it right. falls on local hospital district taxing authorities that's going to have to make up the shortfall, well, yeah. which is what's going to yeah, happen. The North if Broward yeah. District, uh, South Broward, uh, yes. Jackson. Right. I mean, they are, they are going to be in trouble here. Here's, here's why I have a problem with what you just said. Now, I'm not picking gotcha. on you. But for years, the legislature has been bemoaning the fact that Medicaid is a growing part of the budget. They didn't resolve that with this issue. This, that's still a problem. And I don't care if it's whether you get it from the feds. The state is kicking in more money. Just last month, we had uh, the managed care, um, the HMOs who are running Medicaid. They're moaning and groaning that they need more money to the tune of about right. 400 million. And that's, and so that's where's the, real, the savings? And that's a real pushback against what the House is saying. The House is saying, look, the State House, we don't want to expand Medicaid because Medicaid is a broken system. Well, one of the reasons it's essentially broken uh, is that they never put enough money into it in the first place, right. so it doesn't have enough providers and the like. And however. There is a political situation here. Uh, there's a calculation. If you're a Republican lawmaker, chances are your voters are not the Medicaid expansion population. And until the folks on Medicaid and the folks in the Medicaid expansion population actually show up and vote and make this a real issue, because Charlie Crist tried to mm -hmm. in the election and folks didn't show up and vote for him, well, 
this is the government you're going to get. Unless you live in Hialeah, which apparently is the <laughs> demographic that has the most and, people and, enrolled. And when it is going to become an issue is later this month when the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court rules on this King versus right. Burwell case yeah. that Big covers case. the uh, subsidies for people who enroll in Obamacare through the federal exchange, the federal website, which 1.6 million Floridians have done, and about 1.3 million of them get federal subsidies. If they strike down those subsidies and they no longer can get them and afford health insurance, then we're going to have a crisis. And our state has shown no inclination to set up their own state-run exchange, well, we, again, because they hate Obamacare. What, what was we do wrong have, with the Senate plan? Well, what was the argument against the fixed plan, the fixed execution? I love that headline. Well, part that was of a it, part of it if, I, if I may say, and I've listened to that debate, and, and comment on this, if you would, Mark. I mean, a, a lot of House members said, look, the, the fixed plan calls for participants to pay between $3 to $25 a month in premiums, and these are very poor people. Maybe they can't pay. Uh, and uh, other waivers that are needed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, and, and, and we're assuming they will give these waivers. Yeah, more than likely, uh, you guys are talking two separate things. More than likely, the feds, dealing with the feds, whether it's Obama or Bush, who's been the head of the executive branch, HHS, is, it's like dealing with Lewis Carroll. It is, it is <laughs> through the looking glass. It's very difficult to find out what they want. Uh, up That's down, what you're saying. I mean, basically, they're saying Medicaid's a broken system. We don't want to spend the extra money that is eventually going to come. And uh, we to hate Obamacare. That's the other part. In, of it. in the end, it is. By the way, back to King versus Burwell. I mean, my prediction. This hasn't been said enough in the media. Is that the Supreme Court's going to punt? What they're more than likely going to do is they're going to say the U.S. Supreme Court that because the law is unclear. It is going to be up to the executive branch, in this case the IRS, to decide whether or not a non-exchange state can get the subsidy. That is going to put pressure, though, on the Republican candidates for president to say, okay, once you are the head of the executive branch, what is going to be your interpretation? I think that's where the King versus Burwell mm. case is. Well, a lot to talk about in months to come. Um, well, I mean, if we can, let's move on to, uh, and, and we haven't covered this, but I think that it's a complex and and it's going to go on because the lawmakers still have to pass the state budget and, and I don't they'll know do that yeah. when they're going to get to that but it's got to be in the next week or so uh, in in Washington this week a fascinating vote in the House of Representatives overwhelmingly voted that any of these companies that are going to have uh, licenses for ferry service for regular airline service uh, to basically do any business with the government of Cuba, or go to Cuba, can't do business with the government. And, and, and what that means is that none of these companies will ever be able to do business if the Senate goes along. I'm not sure the Senate will go along, but boy, it's, you know, we've got a mixed metaphor in Washington. You've got the president, Doug, who is saying, let's open up, let's have a new relationship. And the House of Representatives this week said no. I don't want to call it the last gasp of the, of the, uh, of the uh, old way of old thinking, way of thinking. Yeah. but it is a gasp of the old way of thinking and the house is the place where they can actually do it but they can still That's gasp where well, they can gasp right <laughs> the senate will not gasp along with them and neither will the president look we're moving towards a policy of more openness and, and obama is trying to push us in the right direction and you have a, a you know a republican controlled house that's going to fight him tooth and nail on everything, no matter what the issue is, whether it's health care or, you know, normalization of relations. And I think, it, like you said, it, it's, we're moving in a direction It's just going to take a little bit of time. Let's remember this, though. We're changing. Cuba is not. Cuba mm -hmm. will not change until Cuba changes. That is the most important takeaway from all of this. And that's, well. that's become more obvious every day that something happens. This is how bad Cuba's economy is. If you want to hire a new business or build a new hotel, who do you go to? What agency? The military in Cuba. Right. That's right. a problem. Yeah. Time no, for a break. Is. We will be right back. Oh, uh, Alexis. And welcome back live in our studio. Some very lively, robust discussion here with our roundtable. And just to kind of button up the Cuba issue, uh, Mike Mayo, uh, any day, I mean, literally, maybe next week, uh, the uh, Obama administration and the Castro government are going to say, okay, we've agreed on embassies, we're going to open embassies, and then uh, ambassadors will be appointed. I mean, this is a wave that is rolling. I don't think there's any way to stop it. And no matter what governments do, let's remember, we're in an age of instant, you know, technology, information, free flow of people and ideas. So 
more people are going there. Airbnb, look at all the bookings there, the, the whole, the, you know, the underground hotel network. Right. So it's, it's happening. And, you know, the government sometimes follows. Uh, and, you know, whether it's matters of policy like uh, police cameras and, and stuff like that, uh, eventually, no matter what we heard from the union there, too, you know, the technology exists. We have instant replay in sports leagues now. I think body cameras, despite the protestations, are going to have to come also in, into uh, the thank local. Thank you the big, so much for that segue into yes. our next topic. <laughs> body cameras. The state is making some laws now. The state, there's the Senate bill enumerating what privacy will mean. I mean, right. I, I have doubts about whether or not it's going to pass. Uh, better said about in, whether in or not it's... In the Florida legislature. Uh, yeah, I have, I have doubts about whether it's going to give people what they want to see. What people want to see is police officers being able to record basically every stop. And so when there's a question about something, being able to defend themselves, uh, yeah, that's the people. Mm -hmm. I do also think that cops generally wind up arresting really bad people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't think every arrest they make is bad. I don't think it's about yeah, arrest so much. No, what it is is it's use a of force. It's a matter of yeah. trust, and because right now we depend on police version of events, usually just through written reports and oral yeah. statements. Yeah. And as that case in South Carolina showed a couple of months ago, that was the most egregious thing, where yeah. the police officer gave his version of events, and then we had a civilian cell phone, which completely at odds with exactly. what the written account. Totally antithetical. In fact, and Fred Grimm in the Miami Herald has a very good column about this case this morning. And Francis Robles in the New York Times had a piece uh, last week about the shooting of Jermaine McBean, this uh, gentleman, 33-year-old uh, a guy with a master's degree in Oakland Park, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the BSO deputy who shot him said in his narrative that there was no reason that uh, Mr. McBean didn't hear the order, drop the gun. He had a BB gun. Of course, the cops don't know that it's a BB gun necessarily, but he had earbuds. I mean, exactly. there was a a resident in a nearby building that took a photo of this guy dead on the ground and you see the earbuds and in fact the police officer the BSO deputy said no he didn't have anything in his ears if we hadn't had that video this case would have just just gone on and it would have been a case of a justifiable shooting now at least talking the, about the South Carolina case. No, no, the, we're, the no, we're talking about the Broward. The one in okay, we're talking about the Broward. Now yeah. we at least have questions about. Wait a minute, did the this, cop not see the earbuds? A, I mean, but again, it comes from a civilian-provided exactly. photograph. Yes. And what what I've heard from some other police is like, look, civilians are going to be taking photos and videos now with the technology that exists. So why don't we get our own cameras so we could give a more complete version of events? And, and isn't that the, what prompted this all? And those I mean, are good police over officers over. who are saying that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Uh, you know, before we run out of time, Mark, I want to say that uh, earlier this week in Orlando, uh, Politico, and you, and I think the editor, uh, was it this week or the print? No, it was Tuesday. This, it was Tuesday. Lost in Time and Space. And you were there covering there. it for local 10 News. But uh, you had a conversation with Governor Scott at your at his beauty contest with all the presidential candidates. And he seemed call. to really enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> Cattle call. Uh, and I've got to say, uh, Rick Scott looked kind of looser and more confident than I've seen him in a long time. Well, he's happy with what he's doing. I mean, I understand Rick Scott uh, was raised poor, built a hospital empire on his own, made hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars, then became governor. Uh, this is a very powerful man who's accustomed to doing things when he wants to do them. And when he wants to do them, he will do them. And can I say, on Tuesday, every single presidential contender announced and not announced yet started by lauding him and talking about Kissing how wonderful ring, he was. Yeah. And like, like Huckabee, is he this, even said the suck-up word. Is this a, a prelude for 2018? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, him running for Senate, that yes. is Rick Scott running for Senate. Yes. Uh, he, he, he's certainly going to keep his options open. And I do believe that if Rick Scott runs for Senate in 2018, it's a midterm election year, uh, I would put my odds on him at least he, winning the GOP he, primary. He I think he was, he was so happy last week because he wasn't in Tallahassee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other point, you know, yeah, every, he was in his element. All the Republican candidates were there. But, you know, it, it, he galls me. I'm sorry. He's shown no le leadership on this whole crisis that's gone on. He, he doesn't want to get involved with the whole expansion, Medicaid expansion debate. And, th then, and now he's going off wailing about hospitals are making too much money and Medicaid's a broken system, spoken from a guy who headed a hospital chain that was fined $1.7 billion 
for defrauding the gov federal government through Medicaid and Medicare overbilling. Yeah, there are ironies that. here. Yeah. Uh, Mark Caputo, a week from tomorrow, Jeb Bush is going to be at the Kendall campus of Miami Dade College, and we presume he's going to announce. He says, I'll make a big announcement. Yeah. Well, what could it be? Yeah, he's it, It'll to, be big news it, if he does not yeah, announce yeah, it. It's not going to be a Caitlyn Jenner announcement, put it that way. <laughs> I mean, this Hardly. Is, yeah, this is the least dramatic announcement we're going to hear from Jeb Bush. I think the headline is Jeb Bush finally tells the truth. Well, he, he's he, he told me the other day he's looking forward to getting going. That's what he said. He's been getting, getting going. going. That's he's the deceptive thing about it. He's, he's collecting money. He's, money. he's, he's been collecting money. He's That's what he's collecting been doing. money. Now he gets. He needs to get some mojo because Marco Rubio has really kind of stolen yeah. the thunder and it, it, it poised himself as the fresh alternative. And they're liking him in Iowa right now too. I yeah. am seeing. All right, gentlemen. We are, and lady, we are done <laughs> with the uh, round table, and, but thank you for coming in. It's always fun to do it. Always great. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, next newly released video may make you question the decision of Broward County Sheriff's deputies who beat a woman in custody. Bob Norman has that story when we come back. some insight in the case of a tourist beaten in jail by Broward Sheriff's deputies. The Sheriff's Office exonerated those deputies, but as Bob Norman reports now, attorneys say the video casts serious doubt on that decision. I had bruises all over my body. My face was swollen. My eye was basically swollen shut. After Audra West, a tourist from Texas, was put in jail for disorderly conduct, an incident with Broward Sheriff's correctional deputies left her this way, battered and bruised. It was frightening. It was absolutely frightening. Now we have this video from inside the Pompano Jail showing BSO Deputy Kristen Connolly rising from her desk, grabbing some latex gloves and approaching West, who is in the foreground just outside of camera view. Another deputy, Henry Lawrence, gets in her way. This is when the deputy's telling her, no, don't do it. But Connolly gets past him and as soon as the second glove snaps on. She grabbed the girl up and started like swinging her back and forth. I'm sitting there and I'm just in shock. This is the inmate in the video sitting in the chair who spoke on condition of anonymity. Did she do anything physically? No. To provoke this? No. Nothing? Nothing. After being thrown around, Wes turns to strike back at the deputy, a mover attorney Gary Collin says was instinctive self-defense. Once West is secured on the floor, Connolly drags her into the strip search room and two female deputies, Joyce Johnson and Dorothy Jenkins, immediately follow her in. The door closes for about three and a half minutes during which West suffered her injuries. He punched me in the face several times. There were other guards in there that were kicking me. It started after West asked Connolly for a tampon. The deputy said to her, no. And that's when she said, F you. Her authority was challenged, and she was not going to let a prisoner under her custody say something to her that she didn't like. Six days later, West filed an internal affairs complaint against her and the other deputies. It was only then, a full week after the incident, the deputy Connolly finally wrote about what happened in a probable cause affidavit alleging Audra West had committed a crime, battery on a law enforcement officer. That makes no sense whatsoever. Obviously it shows that there's retaliation for filing the internal affairs complaint. The state attorney's office refused to file the charges against West, saying she didn't appear to be a physical threat to Connolly before, quote, being forcefully dragged out of her chair into a room. You can hear the screams, you can hear the thuds. The, the banging. I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, they beating her up. Connolly later admitted punching West in the face, and Deputy Johnson testified she struck West repeatedly in the ribs, both claiming it was necessary to restrain West. If Audra was fighting so severely, why didn't the male deputy go into the room? He walks away. BSO policy says any use of force must be both reasonable and necessary. Criminology professor Jeannie Stitchcomb said Connolly's actions didn't appear to be either. She grabbed her with pretty 
uh, aggressive force. But Connolly was never disciplined and fully exonerated. She should be counseled and, and retrained, not only for the benefit of that particular officer, but also to send a message um, that that won't be tolerated in this organization. Just sad to know that the uh, deputy was exonerated, you know, but this is the America we live in. Bob Norman, Local 10 News. Bob, thanks. Sheriff Scott Israel declined to talk about this West case. He did send a written statement standing by BSO's Professional Standards Committee, which made the decision to exonerate the deputies involved. And coming up, stop the presses. The Cuban government did on one South Florida reporter there. The question is, why is anyone surprised? Stay tuned. This beautiful picture now from our Hollywood Beach Cam. Boy, it does look beautiful out there. But let's get a professional opinion from meteorologist Jennifer Correa. Jennifer? Good afternoon, Michael and Glenna. Yes, it is beautiful out there, but we're feeling the heat. Here's another live look out of the point of view from in Fort Lauderdale. Over Fort Lauderdale, we have partly sunny skies in the distance, a couple of clouds associated with some showers. Temperatures right now, though, in the mid and upper 80s. Uh, we do expect temperatures to warm up into uh, the upper 80s, even close to 90 degrees. Some of us could get there, especially the interior parts. This is what it feels like though already 91 in Fort Lauderdale. That's what it feels like when you step outside. The winds are coming in from the east this time and helping to push in some of these shore these showers on shore. Cuba skin could get clipped by that little shower and then we have some sun showers in the rest of the area, but they're isolated. Otherwise, some inland storms cannot be rolled out. Jennifer, thanks. You may have heard about the experience of Daily Business Review reporter Julie Kay in Havana last week. Julie accompanied a group of lawyers from the Florida Bar on their fact-finding trip. And when her reports documenting what they were learning, perceived injustices in Cuba's legal system, quotes from its own internal critics, well, Julie was sanctioned, censored, and almost kicked out until the attorneys with her negotiated her stay. Apparently, no one told the Cuban government a journalist was part of that group. So the South Florida-based attorneys had to choose between making a stand for American ideals or abiding by their Cuban host's rules. The most surprising revelation from Julie's experience is that anyone was shocked by it. That Cuba does not support nor condone a free press, that's common knowledge by now. Did anyone on the Florida Bar group notify their host who she was, why she was there. International journalists are required to have journalist visas. That is Cuba's rule. Skirt it at your own risk. Actually, I had a similar experience in the summer of 2006 when Fidel Castro got <coughs> sick and disappeared from public view. We got to Havana on the first flights we could find. Arriving without permission and without the appropriate visas, we were detained at Jose Marti International for 15 hours, questioned extensively, and then ultimately put on a plane out. Every one of the guards and the agents involved, they were completely respectful and some were even kind. One of them, as he was examining everything in my luggage, asked whether I could say anything I wanted on our television newscast. And I told him, as long as it was factual and fair, then generally, yes, I could. And that either intrigued him or confused him. I couldn't tell which. Of course, Julie Kay's experience comes at a very different time in U.S.-Cuba relations, which makes it really even more telling. As much as President Obama's administration tries to open the doors and promote diplomatic ties, as much as business people start to lay the path for whatever commerce and profitable ventures may become possible, the Cuban government has its laws and demands they be followed. And those laws don't change until and unless the Castros decide they do. For anyone to expect anything less is frankly delusional. What do you think about that? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Email, Twitter, and you see the addresses there. Remember, stay informed and get involved. Have a great Sunday.